Good morning. I want to thank everyone for being here this morning. We do appreciate your presence. We do pray for David and for a speedy recovery on his blood pressure issues he's been dealing with. I want to continue to keep him in our prayers and all others who are dealing with ailments and issues. This morning, I'm going to speak about a subject that I believe we can all be we'll all be familiar with, and one that pretty much will tell us how our world is today. And so, the title of the lesson that we're going to be talking about is "Preach Jesus, but Don't Preach On." And we're going to look at various things because we hear a lot today and have from, for many years, and it seems to be getting more prevalent that people talk about Jesus, but they don't want to talk about his word. They want to mention his name and how they love Jesus, but they don't want to live the life that he's told us to live. So when we deal with people in the world who call themselves Christians or who claim some type of religious affiliation, we'll often talk about, oh, how I love Jesus. Or I've heard people say, Jesus, 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 just walking down the street saying that. Well, you can say that all day long. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean for one's life? Just repeating a name doesn't mean anything unless a person's not going to be living the life that Jesus told them to live. So we're going to consider this morning this particular subject and cover four major areas that people don't want the preacher to preach on and they don't want to be confronted with the truth of the fact that they don't want to hear some things about the Bible. We either love Jesus and are following his word, or we can give lip service to Jesus and ignore what he said. Now, what do you think is going to get us to heaven one day? Sure, not going to be giving lip service and doing what we want. It's going to be following what we're told in God's word. Jesus came to this earth and he died on the cross and shed his blood for us. He laid down his life to save mankind from sins. But in laying down his life, we have to realize what he preached while he was here. He preached full obedience to the word of God, to his teachings, and the teachings of that of the apostles and the prophets, the divine writers of the New Testament. And many people just don't want to follow that. So first of all, there are those who will say, well, preach Jesus, but I don't want to hear anything about doctrine. Brother Dub Myrie passed away several years ago, the gospel preacher. He told this story. He said this occurred in the mid-60s when he was preaching in a congregation in Oklahoma. He said a denominational preacher came into his office and was wanting support of Brother Myrie and all the other preachers in the area. He said he was going to have revival in the city. And he wanted everyone's support. So Brother Meyer said, of course, he had no intentions of endorsing false teaching and false doctrine. And he mentioned something to the man about following doctrine. And the man said, I wouldn't give you a dime for any doctrine, 10 cents. I wouldn't give you a dime for doctrine. And that tells you the attitude. Here's a man that calls himself a preacher that's wanting to have a so-called revival what are you going to revive if you're not going to preach the doctrine of God? Brother Myers said he pointed out to the man that doctrine in the New Testament from the Greek simply means teaching. So he said that, that means you don't, won't give a dime for the teaching of Jesus. Well, the man had a strange look on his face and was kind of shocked that Brother Myers would even say such a thing. But he made his point. He got the point across. And not only that, but the New Testament is the doctrine, doctrine or the teaching of our Lord. And we can't recognize or support anyone who fails to follow the doctrine of the teaching of the New Testament. It's sad that we live in a world today where so many people will claim to have a Bible and claim to read their Bible, they just don't follow it. And that's sad, yet that's the world in which we live today. The Apostle John wrote in the book of 2 John three short verses, verses 9 through 11, in this one chapter book. He said, Whosoever transgresseth, that means you leave the doctrine, you violate something, you go against what you should be doing. 
whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. And if any come among you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not unto your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So what John is writing here, he says anyone, whosoever, that means anyone, it doesn't matter who it is, any person alive who violates, goes on and steps aside, away from the doctrine of Christ, he doesn't have God in his life. He can claim it, but if he doesn't follow the doctrine of Jesus Christ that he gave us, or any doctrine in the New Testament, he doesn't have God. And then he said, if someone comes and they don't bring the doctrine of Christ, they bring some other doctrine, you don't bid him God's speed. In other words, you don't accept him in as a person with whom you agree with what he's teaching and doing. You don't receive him into your house. You don't even let him come in and socialize with you because he's doing something wrong. You don't bid him God's speed. You don't give him the right hand of fellowship saying, I agree with you. Because he said, if you bid him God's speed or if you overlook what he's doing that's wrong and the life that he's living that's wrong or the doctrine that he's teaching that is wrong, he said, you partake in his evil deeds. You're no different than he is. That's what John's telling us. So it's very simple to understand that when Jesus talks about doctrine, he's talking about the truth of the word of God and it's something that must be followed. Yet people today don't want to hear that. It's inter interesting, however, though, the day of Pentecost says when some 3,000 souls were added to the church, these are people who were interested in doctrine. They wanted to be saved. They wanted to do what was right. They realized and were convicted by Peter that many of them had murdered the Son of God and put him on the cross that caused his death. And they were pricked in the hearts and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They didn't want to live in a life of sin. They knew they had violated what God wanted them to do. And this doctrine was important. They had to obey the gospel. Those who had faith were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. And it says some 3,000 souls were added that day. But that's not the end of that story. As old Paul Harvey would say, now the rest of the story. The rest of the story is found in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly, intently, in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued in the doctrine, remember what doctrine is, teaching, in the teaching of the apostles. It was important. It is important to know what the teaching of God's word is. Those first century Christians in Jerusalem faithfully upheld the doctrine taught by the apostles. During Christ's personal ministry, while he is here upon this earth, he warned against worship based on men's doctrines. You know, there are the, doctrine of the, are the doctrines of the Bible and there's also the doctrines of men. And Jesus condemned following the doctrines of men. In Matthew chapter 15 verse 9, he said, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. There are those who have their own beliefs and practices and commandments that are not in harmony with the Word of God. They're not in harmony with what God's Word teaches us to do. And yet people still follow it because it makes them feel good. The Bible says it's vain worship if we do such. So as we go on, there are also those who will say, well, I want you to preach Jesus. But don't preach anything about a church because church is not important. And they use that term loosely. There are many who are attempting to de-emphasize the importance of the church. Most people in the world have little concept of what the church even is. They have no clue. When they think of church, they think of some building. They think of some denomination. Oh, uh, that's their church. They have their church and you have your church and I have my church. Folks, nobody has his or her own church. Jesus died for one church. 
And it's a church we'll read about in the New Testament. And when we start preaching to people about that one church, some people get uncomfortable, some get mad, some just simply don't want to hear it because they don't think the church is important. I remember as a young preacher, and I started out in full-time in the early 90s, that the doctrine was going around or the idea was going around, which it was their doctrine, that we preach Jesus but don't worry about the church because the church is not important. That was a big fad throughout the 90s. It kind of died down and, and now people just don't care at all about the church. They just say, oh, I love Jesus. Or like I said at the beginning of the lesson, they'll say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they think they can say Jesus' name a number of times and that makes everything okay. But it doesn't. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 47, the Bible says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Where were they added? To the church. When were they added? When they were saved. Don't we see now the correlation between salvation and the church? The apostles in verse 42 of that same chapter were teaching these people and they said they, they were steadfast in following the apostles' teaching. Well, part of the apostles' teaching just a few verses down is Peter's preaching at this point. And he said, having faith with God and all the people. And the Lord, that's who did it. It wasn't man. The Lord added to the church. Who did he add? Those who were being saved. Yet some will illogically say, well, you don't have to be in the church to be saved. The church doesn't mean anything. Jesus is important, not the church. Well, if you're talking about denominations, that's true. But when you're talking about the church in the New Testament, it's not true. We must see that correlation between Christ and his church and salvation and his church. Where do we receive our salvation? In Christ. Where are we added when we're saved? To the church. We're going to look at some verses now that will help us understand even more about that. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians 5.23, the Bible says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Notice this last phrase. And he is the Savior of the body. Colossians 1.18 says the, the church is the body. The body is the church. So the body of Christ is the church of Christ. The church was Jesus built. We see also the correlation between the body and the church because it says as the husband is the head of the wife, even so Christ is the head of the church. And the church is his body, just like us. And it's interesting how the Holy Spirit through inspiration had Paul write this in such a way to help us understand you have one head, you have one body. You have one church, you have one body because the church is the body and the body is the church and Christ is the head of the body. The head controls everything the body does. It's interesting how they use all that and we can get these good figures of speech to help us understand just simple things like this and yet the world makes it so complicated because the world says that every church has their own head and then you still have the body. Well, you have multiple heads on one body, which would be a monstrosity, and it's not possible to happen anyway. And yet, we see this so plainly taught in the New Testament. In Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27, Paul goes on on this same thought, and he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Preach Jesus, but don't preach the church. Yet right here in this passage, the Bible tells us the church is holy because he wants to present the church holy before God without spot, without blemish. And that's done by the church being pure and remaining pure. Pure in what? Pure in doctrine and teaching. What else? And the members pure in our lives as we live to keep the church pure. 
The blood of Jesus was shed for the church. It was important enough that he died for the church. Did he shed his, his blood in vain? If the church is not important, then Jesus shed his, his blood in vain. People that say, well, the church doesn't really mean anything. And why did Jesus die? People will say, well, he died to save us from our sins. you realize there are multiple reasons he died on that cross? He died to save us from our sins, absolutely. But he also died to establish his church. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus told Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock, the foundation that, that Peter had just said prior to that, that he believed that Jesus Christ was a son of God. Upon that foundational principle that Jesus is a son of God, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And not only did he say he was going to build it, it's a prophecy prior to his death on the cross. When he died on the cross and shed his blood, he established his church. In Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul told the elders at Corinth, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Take heed therefore in yourselves and over all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now notice what he says here in this next phrase. To feed the church of the Lord which he purchased with his own blood. Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Did he die in vain? Did he shed his blood in vain? Absolutely not. He purchased the church. He bought and paid for it, redeemed it with his blood. Not somebody else's blood. You see the importance now of the church? There's one body. There's one head. Jesus is the head. The body is the church. The life-giving blood that Jesus shed is what saves the church, and it saves us individually as members of the church. But then people will also go on and they will say, well, preach Jesus, but don't preach anything negative. This idea has been around for a long time. It's not that people want to be negative in their lives. But folks, everything's not a bed of roses. It's not sunshine and flowers every single minute of the day. The dark clouds come up in our lives and we deal with problems, we deal with issues. And everything in this world is not positive. Had something pop up on my Facebook recently. I think it was called Positively Positive or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being positive. We need to be positive. We don't want to be negative all the time. We need to be positive in things we do in our lives. But to some people, that's all it is. We can't say anything negative to somebody. You might hurt their precious little feelings. And we don't want to do that. We don't intentionally want to hurt anyone's feelings. But folks, when we are teaching God's word, we teach the truth. And that might hurt somebody's feelings. People don't like the truth nowadays, or a lot of people at least. There are some who do. We should, but there are worldly people who might want the truth. Sadly enough, many don't hear it, but people still don't want it overall. There are those who insist that a preacher should only preach positive things, never anything negative. People say, I want it all to make me feel good. I want to make, make everything so I'm just so happy when I leave. I'm just bouncing off the walls. We ought to be happy when we leave, regardless of what we hear. There are things that might hit us in the heart because our heart's not right with God, and it should hit us in the heart, and it should cause us to want to change our lives. Don't get mad at the preacher. Get mad at anybody. Get mad at yourself for doing something wrong, the preacher pointing it out to help you make a change for the better in your life, to make a positive change. I've heard people say, well, uh, don't, look, don't want these negative preachers or uh, there's too many negative things in the Bible. Why do I want to read the Bible? It's negative. I don't look at any of those things as negative. Anything that the Bible teaches us to change our lives when we're doing wrong is positive. It's positive reinforcement for change for us to be better people and to live better lives. In Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, prior to telling the 
elders here at Corinth what they should do in feeding the flock of God. He says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Things that they wanted to hear, things they didn't want to hear. As a matter of fact, verse 29 and 30, he goes on to rebuke the Corinthian elders. He tells them that there's going to be some among you right here that I'm talking to. They're going to leave the doctrine. You're going to draw away disciples after yourselves. You're going to pull people away from Christ to follow you. After he gives them a, a positive admonition on what they should do in feeding the church of God, he turns right around and he points fingers at him and says, some of you are not going to do it. Some of you are going to go into sin. Some of you are going to do wrong. You think they wanted to hear that? Absolutely not. But did they need to hear it? Absolutely. And he said, and you can't blame me because I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I've told you what you wanted to hear, whether you like it or not. Is that positive? It actually is. It's positive because it helps them to understand what they're going to face in the future and to maybe give them something to think about so they don't do something wrong. However, we see later on, that came true, unfortunately. As a gospel preacher, I am charged to preach the word of God, not to speak smooth things that tickle people's ears, not what we are to do. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, where he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that word in the King James means living, and the dead that is appearing in the kingdom. Preach the word, he tells Timothy. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall be turned away from the truth and be turned unto fables. That's where some of them were going. Now notice he said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Old brother Marshall Keeble used to say, you preach it when they want to hear it, when they don't want to hear it. That's just the way it is. But there are those who just want their ears tickled. They want to feel good about themselves. We can't do that. If we truly love the Lord, we'll do his will and follow the truth. John 14, 15 Jesus himself said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If we truly love Jesus, we won't just go around telling people, I love Jesus. We do it by following his word, keeping his commandments. There were those in Isaiah's day who didn't want to hear it. They even told uh, Isaiah, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Now just think of the audacity of someone coming and saying, don't, don't preach the truth to us. We want smooth words. We want deceitful words. We want you to lie to us so we can feel good about ourselves. That's found in Isaiah 30, verse 10. And yet we have preachers, so-called preachers, around this world that will do that very thing just so they can have the nickels, numbers, and noise. They can have the money coming in, have the pews packed, and everybody happy with everything going on. And they don't want to hear anything that's going to cause them to think about their lives and make changes in their lives. And then next, and finally, there are those who say, well, I want you to preach Jesus, but don't tell me how to live. Now just think about that one. Preach Jesus, just don't tell me how to live. I live my life the way I want to live it. There are those who just don't want to do a lot of things the Bible teaches. They don't want personal responsibility. They just simply want somebody to, again, tickle their ears. There are those who don't faithfully attend the worship of the church. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as a manner some is, but exhorting one another so much the more you see the day approaching. The Bible says don't forsake the worship, yet people will forsake it. For a lot of things. Oh, the Astros won the World Series last night, and I know a lot of people's happy. How many of those same folks who went that game last night are in worship somewhere today? Think about it. Oh, no. They had a celebrating party, probably get drunk. Even if they didn't, 
had to sleep late, can't come to church, can't worship God, too many things going on. I was tired from the ball game. We were so excited and we won. We just parted ourselves out. We're just wore out. God will understand. <laughs> will he? God will understand that Hebrews 10.25 is in there. And how many people are actually sitting in a church building today worshiping in spirit and in truth because of a ball game? Folks, that's where we are. I've seen people miss worship because, oh, they got tickets at the last minute to something. God will understand. These, these come along once in a lifetime. Or, well, I've just got to go do this or I've got to do that. It may not even be a ball game. You just name it. Or someone said, name your poison. Whatever you want, because it's all poison when we forsake the assembly and not worship God. And then those who do attend just say, well, don't preach on giving. You know, I, I spent all my money on the ball game. You know how much those tickets were? Matter of fact, did y'all see how much those tickets were? <laughs> 700 and up for standing room only. And to get a seat, 1,500 to 2,000 a ticket for last night's game and up just to sit down. Oh, well, you know, preacher, I can't, can't give because I spent my money on the Astros tickets. Or you name whatever you want to name. I had to go buy me some new this and new that. I just can't give to the Lord. Remember 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 tells us that we're to lay by in store as God has prospered. We're to lay by. We're to set that aside. When we are, earn our living, get our paycheck in, nowadays you don't get paychecks much anymore. It's all electronic. But regardless, you still get your pay for your work. What's the very first thing you do with your money? Do you set aside, this is my contribution for this week? Or do you pay all your bills, buy your groceries, go out and spend all what you want to do and frivolous things and then say, well, here's what I got left over. Here you go, God, I'll give this to you. Who should come first? Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. How do we seek first the kingdom in everything in our lives, in every area of our life? And giving is one where... People don't like to hear. I know when I went through preaching school, the old preacher at the congregation said he preached on giving about every six months. He was there for over 30 years. He preached on giving every six months because he said you've got to remind people what they need to do because people often forget because they get wrapped up in life and get wrapped up in things and stuff i got to have stuff, and they forget God. We're commanded to give up on the first day of the week as we have been prospered. Are we doing that, or do we give God the leftovers? Back in the book of Malachi, those folks who were giving God the leftovers, God said, you have robbed me. You have stolen from me. <coughs> And what's changed? It's the same thing. If we fail to give as we've been prospered, we're robbing God. Do you understand before God and have him say, you stole from me because you didn't give like you should? Something to think about. But people don't want to hear that. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth the cheerful giver. We need to be happy that we can give to God for everything he's done for us. We realize how much God's blessed us. He's blessed us physically, materially, spiritually, most of all, spiritually. But he's blessed us. And how many of us thank God in return by living a Christian life, by giving back to him in our life and on the first day of the week monetarily? Usually when a preacher preaches on giving, and I've preached numerous sermons on it in the past, they say, oh, the preacher's just wanting to raise. That's not true. That's just an excuse to take a little shot at the preacher for stepping on your toes and maybe your heart too for not doing what you should be doing. And that's just in general. I'm not throwing accusations out at anybody here. Just in general, that's what people do very often. 
We need to remember what God's word tells us and how we're to live. Then some will say, well, preacher, just don't preach on Christian living so much. I know what I need to do, but, you know, we've got to have a little fun in this life. Folks, we can live a Christian life and have all the fun we want to have. There's wholesome fun, and then there's sinful fun. We do the wholesome fun, and we won't miss out by not engaging in the sinful fun. I deal with people on a regular basis who are either high on drugs or drunk on alcohol. And for whatever reason, they think that's fun. I've never tried it. I don't want to. I could care less about it. There's wholesome fun we can have without getting involved in the worldly fun that destroys the mind, alters your thinking and judgment, and can cost you your life, but also will cost you your soul. And yet people engage in those acts and activities all the time. I've never seen where it's fun to go out and do those things that not only harm the body, but make you sick, destroy the body in the process. And yet it's something that people do every day. Don't preach on Christian living. I've got to have some fun. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When we live a Christian life and we serve God faithfully, our labor is not in vain. God's going to reward us with a home in heaven. Those who live otherwise, he's going to reward them in the fires of hell. And that is a reward. But it's a reward for wrongdoing. It's just like when people do wrongdoings, their reward is they get to go in handcuffs and go to jail. And some go to prison. And some get the death penalty for what they do. That's their reward. That's what they get for living the life they live. But the Christian reward is being steadfast and unmovable, not changing our lives, always abounding, growing in the work of God. And God said, it's not in vain. I'm going to give you a reward that you'll enjoy. And it's going to be a home in heaven. If we truly love the Lord, then we're going to want to please Him by submitting to His will. This morning, have you submitted to His will? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you're not a Christian, you're living outside of the doctrine of Christ, outside of the will of Christ, but you don't have to. You can submit your life or your will to doing God's will and be saved through believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God you can change your life in repentance. Turn away from a life of sin. Turn away from wrongdoing. And make a determination in your life you want to live for God now. Confess Jesus with the mouth and be immersed in baptism for the remission of your sins. We read Acts 2.37 uh, and 38 earlier. Those people who believed had a penitent heart. And they were told when they were asked what to do, they were told, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you can do that today. You'll be added to the church to be among the saved and live a life in service to God, saying, preach Jesus and doctrine. Preach Jesus and everything else because I want to go to heaven when this life is over. As a child of God, if you've wandered away from your responsibility, you're not living like you should. Why not come back? Ask God to forgive you. Change your life in repentance. Confess your sins and we'll pray for you. And you can get back on that straight and narrow path because if you're not living like you should, you've left the narrow way and gone into the broad way, but you can always come back. You make that choice and that decision and live a faithful life to work always abounding in the work of the Lord to have heaven as your home. If you are subject in any way today, I urge you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?